Good afternoon, everyone. Craig Kiger with Minnesota DNR Outreach. And today is a very special episode. We have crews scattered about the state of Minnesota. Uh, we've got uh, Robin up on Red Lake. We've got Benji, Nicole, and Mario out on Como Lake in St. Paul. And this is episode 146, live from the fish house. So Benji, would you uh, take it away and introduce your crew a little bit? Great, thanks, Greg. This is gonna be a technology hard webinar for us. I'm really excited to see how this all works and goes from there. Craig, if you want to go ahead and join the slide. We're gonna, you know, obviously ice safety is paramount this year. Uh, we're gonna talk about that. Nicole's our ice safety coordinator. She's gonna talk about how to drill holes, how to check ice, do a little ice safety talk, and we got a really cool video about honeycomb ice we're gonna show you. And then Mario and I are just gonna talk about how to get started on a simple bucket and how we upgrade from that. We've got a couple of shelters down here, a flip over, just a pop-up shelter. We got a big pop-up shelter at the QA section. We'll go up there and talk about that. And Robin's joining us all the way from Red Lake. Uh, she is I'll let Robin introduce yourself. You can give me your full title. Hi everybody. I am the president of the Upper Red Lake Area Association, and I work with a coalition of wonderful people on the Keep It Clean campaign to protect our lakes uh, during the winter time from uh, garbage and human waste, and that's very important. So, one of the things that we talk about through the DNR is keeping our eyes clean as part of the stewardship of our Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. So, we want to make sure we include her in and talk about some of that fun stuff. And she's got a really cool wheelhouse with the Keep It Clean organization. So it'll be the highlight of our webinar today towards the end of that. So I think with that, there's a couple things that might make it easier for you to view. I have a cell phone camera for close-ups. We have white camera down here. So if you want to click on that layout option at the top of your screen and kind of split screen a couple of cameras, you can do that so you can see a little bit better. I think with that, Craig, we can stop the PowerPoint. I'm going to turn it over to Nicole here to talk about ice safety. Awesome. Thank you. Well, exciting to be out here today. Finally have some ice to stand on. It's been a tough winter so far for people who want to go ice fishing. Not so much for the people who like the warm weather. But uh, we finally do have some ice out here. After this, this lake, it froze. Back on December 8th, we were out here, and there's three and a half inches. And then it completely melted. It was open water. And now we're back out here um, with, with ice again. So, um, you know, the ice is never 100% safe. That's what we always talk about. Uh, and the best thing you can do is be prepared for what might, ha what might go wrong. Um, so I have safety gear with me today to talk about for starters. The most important safety gear that you should have when you go out on the ice is gonna be flotation. That way, if you do fall through, you have the best chance of pulling yourself out because the most common problem that um, happens when you fall through the ice is drowning, not hypothermia. Um, and so it's important that you keep your head out of the water if you have that gas reflex and hyperventilation. Um, and then if you have ice picks, you can pull yourself out. So it's, they're very inexpensive and it's a good thing to have with you around your neck somewhere that they're easily accessible. So when you do fall through and you're trying to get out of really slippery ice, um, you wanna kick your feet as hard as you can to get your body flat and then use your ice picks to pull yourself out as you stay flat and you roll away from the hole so that you don't break back through again. Um, it's important that you turn back in the direction that you were coming from when you do try to get out because that's where the strongest ice will be. If you try to keep going in the way that you were going, um, you might just find weaker ice and not be able to pull yourself out. So having flotation, whether it's just a, you know, your summer life jacket will work if it's foam, um, or you can have a float coat or float bibs. So um, float coats have padding inside them, kind of like a life jacket, and they have netting so that when you do start to pull yourself out, they drain water and they don't um, weigh you down at all. And they can be pretty comfortable and they stay very warm. So float coats, what we don't recommend are inflatable life jackets in the winter because they don't inflate very well in cold temperatures and cold water. So foam life jacket or float coat, ice picks. Next thing that I would recommend would be a throw rope. And that's good to have one on everybody, especially if you're going out on ATVs and snowmobiles. Um, if somebody does fall through, you can hang on to it, toss it to them. and help pull them out of the water as they kick. When somebody does grab onto this rope who's in the water and needs to be rescued, you should have them tied around themselves or tied around their hands so that um, they lose grip strength and they need to um, keep hanging onto it. It's already tied around them. They don't have to worry about losing their grip strength. 
And then let's see. So another important piece of gear here. This is going to be your ice chisel. Um, so you want to have a chisel to be able to check the ice out in front of you as you go. It changes quickly. So, um, you know, the minimum ice thickness recommendation that we recommend is four inches to go out on foot. And that can change quickly as you're on any body of water. Um, it might be four inches here, and it could be two inches a few feet that way. So it's important to use your chisel to check the thickness out in front of you as you go. Um, that's just hitting the ice and seeing that, you know, it doesn't go through. Um, it's pretty heavy, so if it is thin ice, it will go through, and then you'll know you need to move away from that area. Um, you want to have a drill or auger something to make a hole in the ice and a tape measure, which is somewhere around here. <laughs> so you want your tape measure so that you can actually measure the ice for yourself. It's important that you measure for yourself and you don't assume that other people were measuring it um, if you see them out there. Don't go off of other people's assumptions. So um, we're going to drill a hole, I think, and look at the ice thickness. I'm going to start my video for you. Stop the record, turn on. It's far enough away. Right. All right. So we go back and move this to the stage. This. There's lots of different augers that you can use, and I think, you know, Benji and Mario are going to talk more about augers later. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and drill a hole here. You want to have on, you know, it's a good idea to have waterproof boots on so that you don't get your feet wet. You can tell we're not too thick. One of the reasons we're doing this, I told all is because we're right on shore. I'm hoping so the water's only one. Damn. Want to make sure that you move away any slush or snow because you don't want to include that in your measurements. And then you want to look at the ice that you're measuring, and we're looking for clear ice. So I'll hook my tape measure underneath the bottom of the ice sheet here, and then measure at the top. And we have about just a little bit over three, about three inches here. So our recommendation before you go out on the ice is to look for four inches of clear ice. We're not going any farther than here because we don't have four inches yet. You know, of course, the only way to check for the ice thickness is to go out of the ice. So you have to check it right away by shore. And if it's three inches, then come back the next day and check again. And this should be to four inches very soon because we have cold days coming in the forecast. Um, but it is really important that you look at the ice to see this clear. And I actually have a couple of slides to show so we can see what other ice can look like. I just going to point out one thing on your feet. Oh, yeah, thank you. Ice cleats are good to have. Um, you can strap them on. They're also relatively inexpensive. Keep you from slipping. Today, the ice is pretty slippery here. We have nice, new, clear ice. Um, and so that can cause a lot of injury and um, ice cleats. And then a whistle. So I have an emergency whistle on my life jacket as well to be able to get help. You can lose your voice if you're in very cold water. But let's show a couple slides. So I have a couple slides to show. We're talking about looking for clear ice, and today the ice is clear, so I can't show you what else it might look like. So I have some pictures to show what you might see besides clear ice. So this one here is the thickness. We can start with that. So like I said, the minimum ice thickness that the DNR recommends going out on is four inches of new clear ice um, on foot. And then going above that, you know, five to seven inches for a snowmobile. If you have a side-by-side -side ATV, those are heavier, and so we recommend a little bit more ice for that. For trucks, we recommend a minimum of 13 inches. And then up to wheelhouses, it really, you have to know the size and weight of your own equipment and the gear that you have in there and the amount of body weight that you have. And on our website, you can actually find detailed information about how much weight can be supported by how much ice thickness. Um, we had to pick what we think is, you know, a good recommendation for general size, you know, up to some, some of the wheelhouses are larger. So 20 plus inches for a large truck and a large wheelhouse is the DNR's recommendation. If you think your wheelhouse is you know, lighter and you want to take it out on less, go look at our website to see what we recommend for weight and, and inches of ice. Um, and then we can look at white versus clear ice. So when we say look for clear ice, that's because when ice first forms, it's really strong if it's, it's clear. But then when it melts and refreezes, 
it's full of air bubbles and the air bubbles make it weak and it actually is about half as strong only so if you see white ice you need to double the ice thickness guidelines to make sure that you're being safe on the ice um in this picture you can see uh the big chunks those are from lake pepin last year where all the trucks went through the ice that were parked next to each other um, so there was a lot of white ice last year because of all the snow and melting and refreezing this year uh, we had some white ice and we had rotten ice with all the melting that we had around the state but lakes like como lake completely melted and now they're starting over with fresh clear ice so that's the only good thing that came of all that melting is that it's all gone and we're starting fresh um, so look out for white ice if you see it double the ice thickness guidelines and then we're going to show a little video of honeycomb ice which is which is rotten ice that you typically see in the spring um, and it's very dangerous when the ice becomes honeycombed even if it's as long as you know or as thick as what it is in this picture in this video here which is about eight to nine inches thick it can shatter super easily so even if you have eight inches of honeycomb ice it's not safe to be walking on so we'll see the see that honeycomb ice here and how easily it shatters So, so it's important that you're looking not only for ice thickness, but the quality of the ice. And that's all year round, whether you're in the spring with, you know, the melting and the rotting of ice or in the winter, in the middle of winter, you have snow and heavy snow can affect the ice and create white ice. Um, you need to be looking to make sure that you understand the quality of the ice and you need to know the common hazards that you might find on any given water body. So if you're not familiar, talk to local experts around the area, talk to, you know, resort owners and beach shop owners and, uh, learn about the hazards that you might find on that body of water so that you can look out for them as you're going and just make sure that you're always prepared for the worst. So even if you wait for, you know, a foot of ice before you walk out, there's always a risk of falling through. So it's just important that you have the right safety gear with you, that you let somebody know where you're going, when you expect to return, and that you have a buddy with you. Best not to go out alone so that you can help somebody if they do fall through. So just have a plan, have the right safety gear, and, um, and you should be in good shape. So I'm going to pass it off to Benji and Mario. All right, we'll jump on screen. One of the things we really wanted to share today was just how easy it can be to get started in ice fishing. So, Mario, what do you what do you really need to get started in ice fishing? Well, uh, you could break it down very simply to a few things. Um, you need a way through the ice, or find a place that someone else already made their way through the ice where you could fish. You need a fishing spot. Beyond that, uh, a string, something with a hook on it, and something on the hook that attracts a fish. And that's kind of it. I know that that like so to the ardent pros out there, maybe the intermediates or people that have seen this before, even folks that are very versed in open water fishing that you're going scratching your head going, Mario, that's crazy. I see all these people with this very fancy gear. Advanced sonar, very advanced rod and reel setups for this. The way that I approach this typically, and the way that I talk about this, that stuff is all for advancement essentially and comfort. Is really all you need: it's a string, a way through the ice, and uh, something to attract fish. And you're ice fishing, so you build up from there. Makes you cut some really nice lake trout up in the body waters with just a hand auger and a rod, and no shelter. We didn't even have a bucket with us. We laid out the ice in sleeping bags. Once you get a hole through the ice, you're just jigging. Had some luck, and it really can be that simple to do. That's very true. Um, and it, so, that, the, the cool thing about that is what what I what I like about fishing in general is just the gives you uh, kind of a forum to be creative. So, I mean, really, when I when I say you need a string and a hook, um, and this is even kind of more advanced than that. If you could find yourself a stick which is generally what this is, if you folks can see this. This is a jiggle stick, um, and you can make one of these if you have a couple of nails, uh, a stick that you might find in your yard from a tree if it's pretty sturdy, and uh, give you a little a cleat to wrap your line around. And if you could find some ice line or some tip-up line, which we'll talk about later, that's kind of important. And then something with a hook on the end of it, um, you have a way to manipulate line through the ice and to attract a fish. That's, that's pretty easy. And even someone who fishes a lot, um, I, I'm in that intermediate group. Um, 
uh, maybe I'll talk about that later. I'm not not a pro's pro, but I'm not I'm not exactly a beginner. I like to go back to this for a lot of different things depending on the application. So it's something I always have with me is is a type of uh, jiggle stick like this that helps you move the bait. Uh, depending on what kind of fish I'm trying to catch and depending how light I want to be when I'm moving. You made a boundary waters example. That's a very good one, especially also the ice is thin. If you're on foot, you don't want to take a ton of gear. That's something you might want to have with you. There's a couple different philosophies in ice fishing too. People really like to move around a lot. Just have a pocket like this that we can come over and sit on and pull our bait. We can throw a couple of rods in here. We can move all over the lake really fast, punch a couple of holes, fish all over the place. Or we can do something like a shelter where you're going there and you're setting up. So your bucket is that we want to talk about the first piece of equipment for comfort beyond the line, the hole in the ice, and the bait. There, there's your bucket. Um, you can do a ton of stuff with it, like Ben just said. Um, you're, you're going to notice a bit of a theme of keep the ice clean. Um, it, it doubles as a nice carrier for gear. You, you, anything you bring out, you want to bring back with you, and a bucket's a great way to, to, to transport that equipment. So um, even without a sled, you got a bucket, you got a seat, you got a carrying case, and you got a way to, to haul stuff off the ice. Look, and one of the things that's we talk about finding fish. So we got I know you got in your bucket, you got a couple of things. You got electronics here. We'll scratch all that. We're talking about beginners. There's a really easy way to find how deep the water is. And there's pretty easy maps. We can go on Lake Finder on the Minnesota DNR site, look at the map. We can look at the contours of the lake and kind of figure out where we think the fish would be, you know, close to the bottom at a drop off. And just by using something like Mario just had there. So this, really this is this technology here is about as old as as it gets, um, as old as uh, any kind of uh, civilization, I suppose. And all it is, if you look real close, it's just a very it's a way. You could get that at almost any bait shop. And if you have your string, and the string you have is is generally long enough. And what I mean by that is, uh, I think I think if you're going to create a jiggle stick or have a rod and a reel, you want to have at least 30 feet of line. That's pretty typical for at least this part of the state as far as how deep you're generally going to fish. Um, you attach this to the end of your hook, and uh, maybe I can kind of maybe I can kind of demonstrate this here. And I'll explain what this is in a minute or two. And you'll also notice me cycling gloves on and off here, so I apologize for the. Uh, for, for my uh, lack of theatrics, but uh, here, this, let's just say that's my that's my string on a stick. It happens to be on what we might call a tip up here, where I come from, we call these ice traps. Which I'll uh, maybe maybe I'll diverge that divulge that information later. Diverge. Okay, so there's my string. Here's my weight, and here's my hole in the ice at my feet. Find a place to set that down. Now this is just a free spooling uh, tip up. And I'll put my weight on the end of the string. This is the imperfect part coming in for you folks that had that discussion earlier. Um, I wish I was fast, quick, nimble, and, uh, and, and very artistic in my uh, way that I do this stuff. But you'll notice that it's cold out and my dexterity goes away. So there you go. That's going to happen. But that's why I keep my two pairs of gloves. There's my weight on the end of the string. I simply put that in my fishing spot or my hole in the ice. And I will drop that down until it hits the bottom, and we're pretty shallow here, so forgive the uh, forgive the quick uh, demonstration. But what I'll do then is I grab my finger, kind of generally at the ice. Uh, you don't try not to get yourself wet. The feet is staying warm. But what I'll do then is I'll mark that spot, and if you have your measuring tape when you check the ice, or you can estimate if you know how tall you are. That's basically how deep the water is underneath me where I'm standing on the ice. Generally, you want to be at or near the bottom with your bait, so that gives you an idea how much line to pay out while you're fishing. And that's all you need to do. Uh, what what would I say typically? Um, at least for around here and most of the winter time, if you're fishing for sunfish, which is most of what us anglers have learned to fish on, anywhere from 10 to almost up to 30 feet um, is, is a generally good depth range to find those fish. Now that is going to vary lake to lake, but uh, if you could kind of figure out what that is. Now, one way to do that without a measuring tape, I'm about 5'10". It's called, the reason they call it a fathom is if you could fathom something, you can wrap your arms around it. Well, if you have a lot of line out, you could start with where you mark your ice and the line that you pull out from the water that has been dropped from your spool 
each one of those is approximately six feet or approximately how tall you are. So if you add all those up together, you get a you get an estimate of what the depth is. And it's as simple as that. No technology other than a weight on the string. Yeah, people people have fished like this for years and it still works. But let's see you kind of start liking this. And you decide, you know what, this is kind of nice. I want to and do something else. I want to do this more. Maybe I want to bring my significant other and my kids out with me. How do I make it a little more comfortable? What can I do to make that a little bit more comfortable? So one thing I just thought of we might have to move that camera to go to earbuds to do this. So Craig's showing a PowerPoint there that shelters, shelters, all kinds of different stuff you can do. I'm going to actually I'm going to turn my camera back on and we'll walk you through a couple of the augers right now. You would probably turn that color from now. When we talk about augers, it's something this simple as, as this little hand auger right here. It's, that's only like a four inch full auger. They, make, they come in a variety of sizes. But Especially if you're going up north to one of the body waters, everybody has one of those because you can't bring motors in the body waters. So they're relatively inexpensive. You can find them online on garage site, garage sales frequently. So that's kind of nice. And Mario brought his propane auger with in the fisherman's office. It's a nice way to go if you like reliability of gas powered stuff, if you're doing bigger holes. You got, I don't know what size auger is that. Uh, th this is an eight, and it, it's about as big as I'd like to go. Uh, it's the slightly more traditional as far as power augers go, aside from the fact that it runs on propane. Um, but it's but for for what I do, uh, I do uh, ice fishing programming with the DNR. I'm in the fishing in the neighborhood program. When I need to drill 50 or 60 holes, um, I could get almost a season out of one tank. So I, I've never counted how many I could drill with this particular device, but uh, it's got a lot of it's got a lot of uh, Drilling power and it's it it's got a, you could you could drill numerous holes if that's what you need this is kind of what you want to go. With. It's, it's also really nice and the ice gets thicker too because you need more power to get to it. For sure. Uh, we do have one of our ion augers over here. It's a battery operated auger also. It's only the two units here. The battery operated. They have several varieties of those and they are very nice and they do work for you. The spud bar Mario picked up, yeah. that's probably one of the first pieces of equipment that people like to get. Dude, Nicole was talking about that for checking ice. So, great way. Also, if you don't have an auger, it's a, it's a great way to uh, get out there and chip a hole that somebody has used in the past. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, you could uh, up to, you know, we, we spoke about ice safety. Always go back to that in your mind. Uh, up to about six inches, these things are pretty darn effective. And they're usually a little bit cheaper than an auger. Um, you know, the hand auger, a good chisel, they're about in the same price range. Um, so don't shy away from that. Uh, the, 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 the lower the diameter of the auger, the easier it is to get through even thicker ice. So the hand augers are definitely a great way to start. They're light. You don't have to mess around with gasoline. You don't have to even have a power source. Um, these two, once again, just for checking ice and ice safety, it's a good kind of walking stick for that. But yeah, um, vacated spots. Um, so if you're Man, if you're looking at these things, like, wow, they look really expensive, and it's, it's maybe maybe this is limiting for some people. Um, this is kind of what you want to get into. Um, I'm not recommending that you go uh, stand over someone who's fishing, waiting for them to leave. But um, I see it all the time where you know if you if you want to zoom out there, if you could see the hole in the ice, um, that may be a hole vacated by a party that had left or the day before. That's a good spot to start if you don't have a big time power auger. Where there's going to be some thinner ice under that concentrated spot and you could get yourself a fishing spot without having to encumber yourself with a ton of equipment so it's actually what we did this morning the hole right behind you there mario was about half inch frozen over we drilled that yesterday when we were out there checking that stuff so we just chipped it out and it's, it a, it's something a like this you kind of chip through and usually you get the diameter of whatever that particular hole was and, and then you're fishing simple as that so let's try the, the next step. So I'm going to try to mute. Cassie and Craig, can you uh, hear us all right now? 
Yes, I can hear you. We Thanks, Greg. So, see, you know, you're starting to get into it a little bit. You start liking fishing, and you want to make yourself a little more comfortable. Uh, one of the first things that is really nice is to get yourself out of the wind. So we have a pop-up shelter over here, just a, a nice simple thing. They're fairly light and easy to use. Give you a little quick tour inside. You know, just coming inside here, this is a small one. You can probably fit two people in here. Um, oh, here, you can open a couple of the windows. First, you can see a little bit. The juice really nice to break the wind. Uh, you can set up, a, set your bucket in here. You can still use the hand auger or whatever you want to put for holes in the floor and fish in there. I do have this full mat here. I bring a couple of these. If you get cold feet or kids are coming with you or whatnot, and you want to keep your feet warm, keep, keep them on a full mat. It'll just putting anything in between the ice and your boot is going to help tremendously. So, yep, kids especially, their boots yeah. tend to be thinner, even if they're rated to a certain degree. I, I get through this with my sons all the time. Just that foam pad, just getting, uh, shutting out the conduction that you get from taking speed, uh, heat away from your feet through the ice. Yep. It's invaluable. And if you want to stay out longer, if your yep. kids' feet aren't cold, you're going to be able to do that. So. Yep. So a simple little, you know, you buy those gym mats or whatnot everywhere. I actually have one out here, but it's just a meal on the ground type mat. You can use these things right here. Uh, a lot of gardeners use them. They're, I don't know, an inch and a half thick, something like that. And just throwing that down. You can kneel on it. You can stand on it. Um, but, yeah, it keeps your feet much warmer still. We have another shelter over here Mario brought over. The sled-type shelters are really neat, too. This is, happens to be kind of a hybrid one. So you can see the sled in there. There's two chairs in there. This one flips over and then has a couple of uh, hub-style things to get a little more room in there. So. If I come in here, I'll look back at the sled. You can easily sit two people, hold gear or whatever you have in behind you in the sled. Uh, you sit in the chair, you got plenty of room to fish, you know, a hole for electronics and a couple holes for fishing rods. So they work really great too. Uh, nice and convenient. You pull them out in the ice, you know, either on foot or if you're somebody that has a four wheeler or snowmobile, something like that, they can tow behind, they're very nice too. So, Mario, what do you think about? Upgrading, um, upgrading above your depth finder. You're just your depth finder. You just throw at the end of the line. So yeah, we're talking about our nicer. weight that we use. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a couple different things, and there's 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 a lot of different ways that uh, that that you could do that. Uh, the more technologically somewhat advanced way is by sonar. And I say technologically advanced, and I kind of I'm gonna kind of amend myself a bit. This technology has been around quite for quite a long time. This is a pretty commonplace. Uh, marine electronics piece that we would call generally what a flasher just because of the way that it flashes on the screen it has a transducer if you have a boat or have ever seen a fish finder before and that's what this is this goes in the water this float sets your depth or basically the depth of this thing below the ice and you have a few switches that are fairly easy to kind of uh Fairly easy to kind of manipulate. Maybe what I'll do is at least put this in the water here. The issue we're going to have here, demonstrating this in very shallow water is tough because yeah. it's going to be hard to kind of, it's going to be hard to kind of get any kind of real good sonar back because it is so shallow. But what you have generally, and what I could do here is actually, this just kind of, for lack of a better term, yells at the bottom. The sound bounces off and it's received right through here. And what it does tell you is the depth of the water. You will see. These little lines here will manifest themselves as marks. And when there's fish under you, this sonar bounces off the swim bladder because it's a density difference, air and water. And that's what that's that's how it tells you there's a fish between you and the bottom. They'll manifest as lines in this little rotary um, display that you have there. And, and that's the why they call color. it. You can see the yellow yep. and the green colors there. So the different colors. We need different things. Yep, depending on so that that's there's my if you can see. Let me turn my gain. This is my this is my personal issue that I have. I like to fish with the with the gain turned way down, um, and that's just that's something. As you get more advanced electronics, you'll kind of know what that means. But that that's the volume essentially. So if you look at the second line, since I have this up a little bit, it's it's hitting the ice. That's how far this this particular sonar is from the ice, and the dial and the numbers 
is calibrated to feet on this. Yep. And depending on the setting, there's going to be different markings, different graduations that are going to tell you what your depth is. So then you could figure out how deep fish are. Um, and this is, like I said, this is commonplace electronics. Most uh, ice anglers that have been at it for more than two years have one of these things. Um, there's, there's, you know, you could pay as much as you want for them. A lot of them change hands over Facebook and uh, Marketplace and Craigslist and things like that and yard sales. But this is a pretty common piece of electronics for fishing. Uh, a lot of people don't like to fish without them. Nowadays, there's advances in sonar that you could see out 100 feet. That's kind of the up and coming thing, the big deal right now to find schools of fish. That's a little bit more cost limiting. Um, but otherwise, the two more common things, once again, the flash of the sonar, and this is an underwater camera. It's very difficult to demonstrate well on a another camera seeing this, to get the kind of computer screen effect. But what I will say is this is nice once you've kind of found fish with your sonar, you could get a good quick ground truth of what they are. Uh, there's a little ethics thing at play here. If you see the fish in the camera and you have an idea of what your scale is on the screen, you could tell if they're small or bigger. You could also kind of adjust the bait you're gonna use depending on the fish that you see. So it's another good way to, to, to kind of find fish. Gives you an idea how thick the ice is too. It's kind of neat to, to put a camera down and kind of see you know, as you're going down, like what the ice looks like, you can kind of tell different layers. This is a black and white display. There's several color displays you can buy. Once again, you can get advanced as advanced as you want. For ice programming that I do, this is nice because it helps me to find fish in tandem with myself. So I think we're going to uh, pass this off to Robin uh, up on Red Lake and have her show you a little bit about a wheelhouse and what that is as we move into our other shelter and we'll get back to you at the Q&A. Real nice stuff. Well, thank you, Benji, Nicole, and Mario for giving me a lot of really good information. And now that I am prepared to go out, I can hardly wait to get there. And I have an opportunity to use something really slick, which is one of these Four Seasons uh, wheelhouses. And in the summertime, I can use this beauty for camping uh, on dry land. And in the wintertime, I can take it out onto the lake for extended stays. I'm going to turn around and walk over here. I'm on beautiful upper Red Lake and uh, we share this lake with the uh, Red Lake Nation. And we also in the, uh, the city of um, Thief River Falls uses this water for their drinking source. So I'm reminded when I'm on the lake that I have to respect the water and do what I can to keep it clean. We can stay for a long time in this beautiful shelter and bring all of our consumables. And we have wonderful amenities here, heated holding tanks for gray and black water. So we can really camp for a long time in one of these gorgeous uh, wheelhouses out on the lake. So when we do that, we have to remember that what are we gonna do with all of our uh, consumables? What are we gonna do with our garbage, our human waste? Um, it's important that we keep it contained, keep it off the surface of the lake. I have a visitor coming up here. This is Scott. He's uh, he's one of the resort owners. Hi, how are you doing today? Lake, so he's happy that the lake is locked up, right? And we're ready to go. And when can this big wheelhouse make it out onto the lake? What's safe for me? We're gonna start letting those go out this weekend great perfect yeah behind like a ranger like this on a dolly great looking forward to it thanks scott so um having said that i can hardly wait to go so when i get out onto the lake i'm going to make sure that i have things in the back of my vehicle such as my garbage cans anything else that i need to set up i'm going to make sure my blocking is kept in a bin so it doesn't freeze to the ice Here's a cooler for some food. Here's some trash cans. They are secured to my wheelhouse so that nothing can get uh, lost on the ice or blow away or sink to the bottom of a hole. Um, so I am ready. This is a very lovely wheelhouse and I'm gonna take you for a little look on the inside. We had this at the state fair, so we've got all kinds of signage attached to it about making plans for when you're out on the ice, ice fishing. Um, I'll stick my head in here. This, this is great. This, this is not like my grand plan a better time. It's a little bit primitive, but um, up here. Up the 
ready. Sounds like we're losing your audio a little bit, Robin. You have our little fish finder going. We have minnows in here and a little bin swimming around, having a pretty good time. Um, so I would say I'm ready to go. I'm ready to camp. I can hardly wait. A couple of things I'd like to remind people of when they go out there, and this you can find out when you go to our Keep It Clean website. I'd like to share with you a plan that you need to make before you head out. So first of all, make a plan for your trash and waste. Uh, removal before you hit the ice and then please use colored garbage bags, which are easier to see. Don't place your garbage and waste on or under the ice. It's a, it's a new law. Make sure your garbage is secure before you leave. So when you get into your truck and you're ready to go, just make sure you've got everything picked up. And then remove all your wood foundation and materials um, when you go. So that's a few tips from me and uh, I'm ready to go catch some walleye and some crappies out here. Thank you, Robin. I think that's you know one of the, one of the things we really want to stress on this whole deal is uh, keeping the ice clean because people will bring stuff on the ice and they forget about it and actually just pulling up here today. There's a McDonald's wrapper laying out here and stuff, and it's all that stuff. Get a really good graphic on. The side of your trailer when I saw you at the state fair, you had a really nice mural about people sitting on the ice and the stuff falling through the ice and the fish are staying away from there because obviously they don't like the pollution either. So keep our keep our lakes as clean as we can. Bring oh there's Craig's got the mural on there. That's awesome. I love how that depicts the um ice fishers on top and what they leave on the ice all ends up in the water. So so keep that keep the lakes as clean as you can. For everybody out there to enjoy, so I I think with that, Craig. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we lost Robin's volume there, but um, so we we've moved up into a little bit bigger shack. This is Mario. What kind of shack is this? How big? This is a. Let's see. It's I think it's officially listed as one of the uh, like six to eight person type shacks. It's okay. a it's got a hexagonal shape. It's made by Clam, no endorsement there or anything like that. But uh, it's a Clam eight ninety, and it's a hub hub pop out. So these each side has four arms essentially to it or posts, whatever however you you know. And they they actually are from a pressure point, and you pull them out. That creates the structure and. Uh, it wraps up into a bag, say about uh, about six feet long. It's fairly heavy. You're gonna need something to haul it around, but yep, this will fit a bunch of people pretty comfortably. And we have, you know, the, I think these things are great, um, especially like I have one for my kids. We come on the ice, we're out of the wind. We're we got a little heater down here. I can show you that in a second. Um, we got a little ceiling fan up here just to keep the air moving around. We got foam floor in here, so our feet aren't gonna get cold. Obviously, all that comes at an expense, and the expense to me is it's not very mobile. So I come out in the ice, I set this thing up. I'm going to be there for a while. I'm not going to hold hop and, and go all over the place. I might set up a base camp and then go outside and hold hop a little bit and let my kids fish in there and see if we can find some different stuff. But um, it is nice to have a base camp like that, too, especially with, with kids or if you want to stay warm out in the ice. So I'll see if I can give you a, a quick little tour of this without damaging anything we do have on the ceiling and Mario was talking about that I just got a little battery operated ceiling fan um, they're super nice for keeping the air moving uh, the bad thing with burning any fuel in a in a tent is obviously carbon monoxide you want to be super cautious about that the propane gives off a lot of moisture too so not having that airflow um, going is is uh, important to do so i also bought a battery box so this one actually has a speaker on the other side we got the ceiling fan running on there we got my laptop plugged in so we can keep power out here so some little things that aren't crazy expensive but make your stay out in the ice pretty nice we go down in the cold mario's feet there too and see the uh, keeping your feet off the ice yep. keeping your feet off the ice so in my personal hot ice you have foam pads that go almost the whole floor but it's super nice to have so i think with that uh craig do we have any questions in the 
Oh, yeah, Mario. Oh, Mario, you're going to show your contour maps too. We didn't really yeah, I suppose. I mean, so yeah, we, we kind of went over a lot of things really quickly, and it's a lot of information coming at you. Um, and there's all these different ways to get super technologically advanced. The one thing I would recommend now, depending on your level uh, of, of where you're at in your fishing journey, so to speak, how often you've ice fished and things like that, like an easy way to figure out. Benji said about being mobile and things like that. Um, I cannot stress enough the uh, like the, the state of Minnesota has Lake Finder online. We have contour maps, and these are available at a lot of different stores. If you could find the lake you'd like to fish on. This is an example of a Chanhassen Eden Prairie area lake called Lotus. It's just to give you an example. It's a contour map. That can help you narrow down where you'd like to try to fish based on the depth of uh, different things of what we call structure on the bottom of the lake. And if you kind of do that a little bit before you go, um, it might help you narrow down where you might find some fish. And it's a way to kind of maximize your time if you don't have all that much time. And it's it's a way to kind of take a first step into finding fish without even having to go on the ice. So I highly recommend Lake Finder if you are technologically advanced enough to go online and find that. Or if you like the smell and feel of a book, um, these things are available at, even at Walmart, but also yeah. at any of your sporting goods stores that sell fishing equipment have lake maps. This one is for the West Metro area. That's why I have it. That's Hennepin Harbor in Scott County. But um, I think Wright County is included in here too. But and speaking of all these maps, one thing I know, I think I've seen you do it before. I've done a program too, is I, I'll print one out. Like if I'm coming out to Alma Lake, I'll print it out. And you should talk just real briefly, and we'll put a link in there for the FIN program. But the FIN program, if you're in the seven county metro area, is a phenomenal program. And it gives you some great lakes to get out that have in the summertime, they have fishing piers. In the wintertime, they're usually just walking access. So people don't have, they're not out there with trucks, they're not out there with four wheelers. And that's kind of nice. I think just be in a city like St. Paul or Minneapolis and be able to get out, get out on the ice and not have snowmobiles and four wheelers and stuff running around. I think it's awesome. So, yeah, it's a good place to start. Uh, the, the, for one, the, the a lot of the lakes are under 100 acres, which puts them in the small impoundment category. So it's going to be slightly easier to find fish. Like Benji said, the, the lack of traffic uh, makes it a little bit, uh, you know, maybe a little more comfortable for some people. One thing I will caution, and we're going to go back to ice safety here. A lot of those lakes are aerated. And what that means is they have a device that's that's um, creating or keeping the oxygen at a certain level to overwinter their fish communities there. These are tend to be more shallow uh, they may go uh, anoxic, which means their oxygen depletes enough to, to kill fish. They prevent that by aer winter aeration. It's up to the municipality, the city around, to mark those properly uh, uh, at least 100, I think, yards distance yeah, uh, away from the, the center of that. And there are thin ice signs. You'll see those. They have to be they're diamond shape with, a, with an orange border. Keep, in, keep that in mind if you're ice fishing lakes in the fin program. Many of them are aerated, and you can find that from your city's web pages if you're looking, or just by actually going to the lake, you can see where those devices are, and they're, they're properly marked. Steer clear of those areas, and you're generally, you know, once the ice guidelines that you followed that you learned today, uh, you know, you could fish in those areas away from that aerator if it's an aerated lake. I would add in too, looking at the depth is really important for ice safety. Um, there's a couple of local lakes right by here. So we're at Como Lake. We were going to be at Phelan Lake. Um, Phelan Lake is very deep. So even though it's a small lake right here in the city, you might think that it would freeze over the same as Como. It doesn't um, because it can get to be almost, it's in around 90 feet deep. So compared to Como Lake, that's why we're here because Phelan right now is, is not really thick enough ice. It's a little sketchy out there still. So. We checked it out the other day and there's actually open water but 10, 15 feet from where we were sitting mm -hmm. or where we were looking to hoping to set up. So one of the reasons we came over here with Kuno, so. Just remind everybody to put your questions in Q and A. Um, where Mario and Benji and Nicole are, you guys probably use a lot of waxies or small crappie worm or minnows for fishing. We forgot to bring that up. We didn't talk about rigging rods. And I know Cassie put in the chat a couple, uh, Scott McIntoon, a fellow worker, co-worker of ours over in Hutchinson area fisheries, did a talk on ice fishing for panfish. Um, we've done one on sturgeon. Mario's been on talking about the fin program. So we talk a lot about rigging on that. So please check those videos out also. But I would say, but, but yeah, uh, to, to your to, to your question, do we use waxies, especially? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say I, I like I like to uh, narrow it down to two essential baits. When I do open water, it's night pieces of night crawler, and when I'm doing ice fishing, it's pretty much exclusively wax worms. 
they happen to be the most effective in catching the broadest range of, of fish. So if I'm not targeting specifics, um, you know, I'm not necessarily going after pike or walleye or things like that. That's what I will use because to a degree, anything around is going to bite one. I've actually caught plenty of pike on wax worms. They tend to be pretty inexpensive, um, but I don't limit it to that. You know, depends on your comfort level too, gross out factor and stuff like that. I, I'm a, I, I should be a, I should be a corn seller i think at this point because that's usually where i point people if they really don't like touching worms but yeah this this is a bait pocket it's got wax worms in it for sake of uh demonstration they're a little larval stage they're actually you know to call them worms is not exactly correct let me see where do i need to be right up here that's what they look like um and uh they're they're you know they don't move around too much they are live bait they're pretty much they're everywhere you could buy bait they're gonna have wax worms that's gas stations to walmart to to bottom growers shops. Yeah, they have them everywhere. And it's a good place to start. One of my coworkers here in the Grand Rapids office just landed a nine pound Northern on a waxy. There you go. So let's jump up everything. to, let's jump up to Red Lake, 270 some miles from you guys. And what's your preferred bait up there fishing? Robin. We've got some shiners in the bait bin right now. I use minnows and a red jig and catch a lot of walleye. It's pretty simple. I don't change my strategy too often. And Jason just asked the question, is there a good way to keep shiners alive? They seem to die before I get to the lake. Uh, well, we keep them in cold water. We put a little bit of ice in the water and uh, hopefully that keeps them alive long enough. It doesn't take us long to catch our limit up here. I would I would say uh, you know when you buy your bait have them put them in a oxygen bag mm -hmm. uh, if you got to travel any distance to get to the ice um, that's what we used to do and you know if you're gonna fish for large pike you might want to go to a big sucker minnow you know that uh, usually worked pretty good down here um, you know and make sure your your rod. Uh, and line are going to kind of match that nine pound northern. He brought that on a four pound uh, test line. He was fishing for crappies and he caught that big northern and was able to get it through the ice. But, uh, you know, just match your equipment to the species you're going after. Um, find the, the bait shop in that area. And I know on one trip to Lake of the Woods, the guy swore by this one little jig and it's like, oh, really? So we bought one, fished with everything else, put the jig on and caught our limit in about, what, 45 minutes. If we would have started with that jig, we probably would have done a lot better. But- Both um, recommendations are awesome. Both from yep, the shop yep. and from my safety factor, finding out yep. where to go and where it's safe and the best thing to use. So- I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, you know, we talked about bait, we talked about, uh, how to rig it up in some of the other videos. Nicole did a great job talking about the safety equipment, um, speaking with past experience of walking through the ice. It's it's not a very pleasurable experience. And uh, luckily we, we didn't, never put a snowmobile through or pick up or anything like that. But I, I did go through one time when I was a younger person. Um, Guys, I don't see any more questions rolling in. Audience, if you got anything, make sure you get it in the next minute or so, or we're just going to close this episode out. Uh, Cassie sent me a message here. Let me pull it up. I'm going to add and, something that I, so there's lots of stuff that I, you know, skimmed over, didn't say about ice safety. One thing that I should have mentioned is, you know, there's lots of factors that affect the ice, right? So uh, people think about the temperature, which we've had warm temperatures above average temperatures this year in December. Um, but the wind is another huge factor that people might not think about if you're new to the ice. So wind is a really big factor that can quickly deteriorate the ice and um, break off large chunks of ice like we did see on Upper Red Lake, especially before it's completely frozen over. Um, so look at the wind, look at you know rain. Rain is a huge factor. If there's water on top of the ice and the wind, that can really quickly deteriorate the ice. Um, you know, depth of the lake, and currents, um, if you're going under bridges, that's where ice is often a lot thinner. So be careful underneath bridges, areas where the, uh, the water's moving faster. So definitely there's, there's a lot to understand about the ice. So if you are new to it, make sure that you know, you're, you're with somebody maybe that 
has some experience or you talk to local experts, you follow people on Facebook to learn more about ice safety and, and think, have the right gear. And one of those things so, too that we didn't really mention was have somebody with you. Mm -hmm. Don't be the one person that's out there in the ice going by themselves because you don't have any way. If you can't get out yourself, you have nobody to go get help or anybody to help you out with a throw rope or something like that. So yeah. um, travel in pairs is is always that's a pretty, great idea. Pretty good advice for any outdoor pursuit, but especially yeah. especially ice fishing. Yeah, good to have somebody to call for help or you're there to yeah. call for help for someone else. Yeah. So I just got one uh, thing I want to mention here. If you're in the metro area and you'd like to try ice fishing, uh, you can reach out to. Uh, Silverwood Park, Three Rivers Park District, they're going to hold an ice fishing event on January 21st from noon till four. Um, Benji, do you know anything about that event? Are they providing everything that people need or they need a license for that day? They are. So, you know, um, there's a couple of events I put in there. I don't know if Cassie, you can put some of those in the chat, but uh, Three Rivers Park District, Nick Sacco out there is doing a couple of events. Dodge Nature Center is also doing one up in Crosby Park, I believe. Craig might have to remind me of the day. I don't have that in front of me, but um, that one too is it's a family and friends ice fishing event. So reach out to these organizations if this is something you're interested in, and I uh, just want to explore a little bit. Three Rivers Park District, the Fin Program, and yeah, I got one, uh, um, it, a couple actually. Uh, so Minneapolis Parks Board, uh, Pete Yeager is the fellow's name, and he's got a couple. First one's on February 3rd. It's on a Saturday. It's going to be at McComas. I think there's two different sessions. Check with that because I think there's some registration. There's no cost associated with it, but I think they want to have you on the list and to, to get a general count. I think there's also one tentatively planned for February 17th. We're, we're, we're still waiting on good or better ice, rather. So keep that in mind on the earlier ones. And things are getting shuffled around, but those are two other opportunities. Minneapolis Parks Board. Got uh, some questions that have come in, guys. We've got about eight minutes to get them answered. So, uh, Mary wants to know if uh, do any of you wear inflatables? And I think Nicole touched upon that. You said they don't inflate very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, we don't recommend wearing inflatables on the ice. Anything below fifty degrees water temperature, we don't recommend um, inflatables because they are known to not inflate properly. And so we do recommend foam, just the standard inherently buoyant foam life jacket or a float coat, um, not inflatables in the winter. Side okay. benefit to the foam is it keeps you a little bit warmer too. It does, yeah. yeah. Helps wrap yeah. warmth if you do fall in the water. So, you know, keep your body warmer and make it easier for you to work your way out of the water. Okay. And Andrew asked, uh, when looking at a contour map of a lake, what are you looking for to find fish? That's a great question. Oh. Yeah, you want to that one, it's fine. Um, well, I mean, there's there's a few different things you could get. You could get very advanced and down to like a contour that's you know down to a foot or less. Things like Navionics on your phone, but generally, like it, it depends on the the fish you're going after. Um, I have a tendency to look for very steep changes in, in depth. So if you picture it being kind of like you saying going downhill. What I like to do is when I'm looking for fish is I'll go along those or find those areas where the contour lines are really close together. And then I could fish, I could kind of, my lateral distance gives me a big change in depth. And then generally what you'll find is fish associating with one of those depths and be, usually in between your shallowest and deepest. And you can tend to find groups of fish that way if you don't have very sophisticated electronics. There's also things like inside turns and outside turns. Those are kind of where you know, two, two, two shallower points kind of meet, and there's contours in between those that look kind of like little alleyways. Those are things to look at. Um, pinch points someplace, yes. similar like deer hunting, you're looking for an area in the water that would funnel fish through yep. there. Underwater points are another good one, and you could kind of tell those because they, they look like, basically, if you look at the land, where the land is, little U-shapes going away, the contour lines make little U-shapes going away and it gradually gets deeper. Those are underwater points. Those are another place to check out and I'm trying to think of who like does these. Like, I know like it's a it's a passive thing, but there's so many different videos on YouTube that show you how to very sophisticated ways that they look at contours and how they, you could go out to an area and, and use GPS technology to kind of map an area and then I find walleye in those areas based on an overall contour, but they get really, really fine. So, and, and sometimes these maps will have, I know over at uh, Willow River State Park in Wisconsin, 
they have they had to drain the lake there because of the dam and they put bunkers down mm -hmm. so if you can go out there and find those bunkers that's where the fish are hanging out so we went we went out there canoeing in the summer and when they were putting them in and we tried to mark them on gps so that we could go back there and ice fish them so that's where the blue gel and are yeah. hanging out because they have good, good shelter and good protection there. so there's definitely a lot of folks that know better than me but that's that's the best tip i can give you Just, yeah. and it changes in depth um and then you know oxygen is going to play a role too so don't don't always just assume you go to the deepest hole in the lake uh, unless it's a lake where the deepest hole is 10 or so feet um you know to keep keep that in mind too i i like that 10 to 30 feet um and i could find usually can find sunfish and they, they may not be trophies but i usually could kind of find some bluegill some bass and some crappie within that range but yeah changes in depth Travis uh, asked a question. This is a really good question, but are there any special licenses we need to be aware of when out on the ice? Do we need to display anything on our fish house, hubs, shelters? You're leaving it out overnight, right? Yep. So it's just a pop-up. You don't need anything on there. Yeah, so if you're talking your yeah, your your hub your houses, yeah, then you're an enforcement person. So I'm I'm just a fishery specialist, so yeah. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you're if you're not going to occupy a, a, a dwelling, a nice dwelling that you leave there, it has to have a, a tag on it that, you know, typically it's like a boat, it's three years. Um, and there, well, there's different options. You could buy a one-year pass or a three-year pass, but if you are going to vacate it and leave it there, um, that has to have, uh, you have to have a license for it. I think wheelhouses now are kind of going towards that as well. Um, but no, I mean, you have your fishing license if you're over, if you're 16 or over. Um, there's a lot of different options for that and that of course um you, normally if you're if you're also if you're asking about these triad events permitting um is typically covered by the host usually those are catch and release keep that in mind so there are some opportunities if you're trying it and don't have a license you could go to these events but yeah i recommend to anybody to have a fishing license if you're under 16 you do not need a fishing and ice fishing gets a little weird because there's a lot of times our, our licenses change in march march 1st so there's a lot of times you can go from February 29th this year to March 1st and forget to buy that license is, and you have to buy your 2024 license. In terms of March 1st is the license year. So yep. if you're going to, there's some seasons that are still open. And we should point out too that this weekend is taking an ice fishing weekend. So if you do are in an area that is safe to get out there in the ice. Yes. You see ice safety, we, we talked about a lot today. Um, if you bring a youth with you that's under 15 or younger, you can go out for free. So, and there's, I know there's a couple of events around, especially up north, taking advantage of that. So, what was the mileage between us and St. Paul and Red Lake? 270 miles or something like that? Something like that. Yep. And I think the ice thickness is about 10 inch difference plus. Yep. So, keep that in mind. So, there gives you a little bit of latitude adjustment for yeah. take a kid ice fishing weekend. Be very, very, very careful this weekend if you're in the metro and thinking about it. Yep. And everywhere, because I feel like what I really like to look at is the lake ice and maps that we have on the DNR website. And you can see that if you look at some of those maps, it doesn't always matter where you're at in the state. Like there are lakes up north that, you know, freeze a lot later than others. They're all different. So um, just because one lake up north has 12 inches, that doesn't mean that they all do. So just make sure that you're right. always do your safety checking. checks. Yep. And I realize we're just one out of time. So I want to say thank yep. you, everybody, for joining us. Robin, thank you so much for uh, giving us the message, message of keep it clean out there and talking about your organization a little bit. Um, we do have the link in the chat. Everybody wants to click on that and learn a little bit more about keep it clean. And joining us from Red Lake, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Join us next week for episode 147, live from the boat show. So Benji will be our roving reporter there. I'll be there too. <laughs> See you there. Well, yeah, cool, okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Have a safe Cassie. weekend out there and hopefully get outdoors and enjoy it.